We've gone through the CE certification process that uses ISO standards to their most rigorous standard, which is Category A Unlimited Offshore. They certify that that boat is safe. The boat design and build is safe to be used in unlimited offshore conditions. Uh, if you see a boat that carries that, you know they've gone through a pretty rigorous testing process to attain that CE Category A certification. Uh, you get down to Category B, still a great certification. That's kind of where the fantail is. Uh, she's only there because of her size. Uh, doesn't have lifelines and pulpits as standard and a couple other things that limit her ability to, to meet that Category A size. You start getting into the C and D, those are boats that, you know, I don't know where I'd take them offshore or how far offshore I would take them. Yes, all the way back. I believe your dad owns hall number one? He does. Okay, well I had the opportunity when I was at Wyatt Printing doing some business for our squadron. And I was sitting there minding my own business in the lobby doing some work for our squadron. And your uncle yes. happened to strike up a conversation with me. I'm a power voter. So I, see. Don't, I don't understand a lot of what you just said. <laughs> anyway, he was very, very proud of you. And I thought you should know that. <laughs> Much. Yeah, my uncle is uh, one of the principals of Wyatt Printing down here in the Akron area. Um, and actually, was trying to attend tonight, but unfortunately, he had to go to my house and let my dog out because my wife's out of town. So. <laughs> but no, my uncle is a power boater. I've been blessed that uh, growing up, my dad had sailboats all along, but both of my uncles on either side had power boats. So, water skiing, tubing, the one uncle had for that. My other uncle always did the big power boat cruises with his big sea ray, so. I'd get taken along as a babysitter to go on the family cruise up to uh, Putin Bay, Cedar Point, and Kelly's Island. Uh, and then on the racing side, the sailing side, my dad had that covered. So I've been very, very lucky on that front. Yes? Um, you mentioned that the, the hull is all cord. Yes. Um, I've seen other boats advertising to me bragging about their cord above the water line and fiberglass solid below. What are the pros and cons? Um, biggest biggest con to not having a cord structure is going to be weight and stiffness. Um, basically, the easiest way to explain a cord laminate is to think of it as an I-beam. You've got the top and bottom flanges and the inner web. The flanges are there. The separation between the two is what gives it stiffness and strength. So we're using the core in the middle to, be, to separate those two inside and outside skins to give the laminate stiffness and strength. Um, in terms of why not to use coring below the waterline, uh, my argument would be that it's most likely cost related. Uh, we use a higher density core in every boat below the waterline. It is much more expensive. Um, but again, on the weight side of it, you can't match the cord structure. We engineer all our laminates so that we know, you know, kind of where anticipated loads, anticipated impacts are going to be. You're going to have a thicker, heavier outside skin and inside skin up in the nose cone. Uh, that 5300 I showed you a picture of, we did uh, a through hull sample at the bottom of the anchor locker drain. That laminate in the bottom of that boat above the waterline was about an inch and a quarter thick. And that was a solid glass structure right there. So we reinforce in any, any high load or potential impact areas like that, we add additional glass. We still have the stiffness of the cord structure. We think we add the benefit that you know they claim they get with a solid structure by adding localized reinforcements versus just saying, forget it, we'll do everything below the water line inside the class. The other one they'll tell you is, I'm sure, that below the water line, then you don't have core below the water line and the potential for water migration. We combat that by everywhere we're putting the hull of penetration, you won't be drilling into any corn. Uh, and same thing goes for when we build the inside of the boat. When we're building the inside of the boat, we don't drill or tap into the inside of the hull. We'll glue to it and then hang off of whatever we glue to it, but we're not going to run a fastener into the structure of the boat where we might compromise or potentially introduce water days, weeks, months, or years down the road. I have two questions. When you're designing a hull on the, on the 101, yeah. now I'm a power boarder, but I'm fascinated with the construction <coughs> and the design. The dynamics of that hull for racing, it, how do you know what's going to work and what doesn't? I mean, you just don't pull it out of thin air. Do you go from other designs that work well and maybe ones that haven't, and then you try to incorporate that in, into a new design? 
that's it, it's very much an evolution. Um, you know, some of the bigger builders or certainly leading edge design shops, they'll push to an extreme. They'll have you know blunt bows, wide flat transoms. Uh, what we do, be it Fort Tartan or CNC, is an evolution. We look back at what at this point is almost 50 years of designs, what worked, what didn't, and what we can do better next time. Uh, so doing the 101, I pulled strongly from you know the Tartan 4000, um, the CNC 115, 99, similar boats, great performing boats, and then kind of pushed it another step farther in the performance direction, but not a huge leap. Something that we were going to be very comfortable with would be a good performing boat. My, my other question is, when you manufacture the, 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 the lead keel, mm -hmm. do you make that in-house yourself, or is that outsourced? And, and how is that made? Is that with molten lead that's poured into a mold? Yeah, the, the lead keels are all outsourced. Uh, we use two different suppliers, one in Canada, one in Rhode Island. Uh, basically, what we do is we send them a pattern, a plug like the hole in the deck plug. We send them the shape of the final keel. They take and they build a concrete mold around it. That concrete mold cures for four to six weeks, make sure all the moisture is out of there so that it doesn't crack when you pour molten lead into it. And they basically heat up the lead, dump it into the mold that also has, at the time it's made, the keel bolts are kind of fixtured in there. So they're pouring hot lead around the keel bolts. It fills up the mold and it encapsulates those bolts in the, in the molten lead. Uh, once they do that, they pull it, they'll grind it, ferret, make it smooth, and ship it to us. Uh, we do not play around in the lead industry. Um, Tartan actually had a, a plant in Hamlet, North Carolina at one point uh, where they did pour their own lead. Needless to say, when they moved out, they gave the property away because of the EPA cleanup costs. So we're not going back down that road. What, what type of material do you use for the core underneath the water, from the water line down? And does that transition to the rail? It does. Uh, the cores in all the hulls that we build are, it's a, it's a closed cell PVC foam, uh, very high density. We use a higher density below the water for impact resistance, wave making, you know, stop the boat from oil canning basically. Uh, and then above the water line where there's less chance for impact, you don't have the oil canning concerns nearly as much, it's a lower density. Uh, it's, it's imper impervious is the wrong word. It won't allow water to migrate if you do get it in there. And it doesn't, water will not degrade it long term. Um, so that's the big advantage of the foam. That's why we use foam in all the hulls. Is there a reason why you don't use that in your decks? Uh, it's actually a couple different reasons. Uh, one of which, the biggest one is going to be impact. Um, if you sharp point something, uh, i.e. a guy drops a screwdriver from the top of the rig, it'll go right into the balsa. Uh, the foam, or excuse me, right into the foam. The balsa handles that a little bit better, is a little bit better on that side of it. Uh, then the other side of it is, it becomes a cost-benefit analysis. Um, yeah, we're saving the weight, we're building the core structure, we're getting a great product with the balsa without necessarily going to the complete level of the foam. Maybe time for one more question. Uh, okay. what, what's the biggest change you see coming down the road in the next 20 years for Tartan? <laughs> wow, if only I had a crystal ball. Uh, <laughs> um, I, I'm talking about the design of the boat. Is there anything you foresee as something that's going to come to fruition? <laughs> I don't think you're going to see anything radical right now. Uh, there's some interesting things on the horizon in terms of propulsion systems, hybrid electric, that kind of stuff. Um, but for, for companies like ours, we tend to kind of let that one get out there and prove it out. Um, you know, prime example is a dock and go system. It was all the rage here two years ago, three years ago. Well, Benetton and Janot wound up going out and replacing those all over the field. Uh, we deliberately step back. We let somebody else prove it, prove it out in the field, and then we'll step in. As a small company, you know, we don't have the resources to go out on the limb like that. In my mind, uh, one of the, the first focuses you're going to see out of Tartan CNC is delivering the product to our owners that is what they want. Um, you know, for years, and they're beautiful boats, our Tartans are, are really over the top. They're just incredibly well equipped, stainless steel everywhere, absolutely gorgeous, teak all over the place. You know, beautiful boats, very expensive boats. Uh, we want to take a hard look at, you know, what is it that we're really delivering and what is it that our customers really want? Do our customers really care that every deck on, every block on deck is stainless? Do they care that all the port lights are all stainless? Um, you know, things like that. We, we want to work hard at delivering the best value that we can to our customers. <coughs> and I think that's going to be the biggest focus over the next couple of years. Um, as, you know, as the, the world tries to recover and the economy gets better, let's focus on that, sharpen our pencils a little bit, and, and try to make sure that we're truly giving our customers what it is that they want. 
One last question. <laughs> What's the farthest way you ever shipped a boat? <coughs> um, we, globally really, uh, we just shipped the Tartan 4000 to Japan, Fantail number two went to Japan, we got a number of boats in uh, Australia, Russia, Southeast Asia, we're all over the place. Thank you, Tom, and we enjoyed your talk, and here's a little memento of the Acura Sail and Power Smart. Hey, you display it in your... Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.